uh, Brother Bennett talked about unlearning some things. My mother taught me to, she, she taught me to pick up my socks and, and take out the trash. And now that I've been married 48 years, I've unlearned to take out the trash and pick up my socks. You know, so, uh, uh, and uh, yes, uh, Dr. DeVitro was standing up when he was preaching, so. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to calm down a little bit, if you don't mind, if you'll just give me a second or two. Uh, I'm reminded of the young man that saw this pretty girl, and he just thought she was the most beautiful thing in the world. And so uh, he asked her dad if he could take her out, and dad said, yes, uh, you, you, just, you can take her down to the soda shop and you know, spend a couple of hours this afternoon down at the soda shop if you want to. So they went down to the soda shop, and he was, uh, he was just real fidgety and nervous. And, and he just, she was just the most beautiful thing in the world. He'd never seen anything like that. And uh, he, he practiced all day. He said, I'm going to tell her, when I look at you, time stands still. And so he practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced. They would sit there, and they... They shared. Uh, they they uh, got a, a milkshake and, and shared the time together. And he got up the courage and he leaned over and he said, "You know, you got a face that stop a clock." <laughs> so uh, when we get nervous, we say some things that we don't mean to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> I tried to get all this foolishness out before Dr. Waite got here, but, you know, I didn't. So uh, I want to begin tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, reading from a passage of Scripture that's going to scare, uh, probably scared Dr. Waite when I told him the title of my sermon or, or the subject of my sermon that scared him. And, but I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 19, if you would. Matthew chapter 19, and, and look in verse 1. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. <clears throat> And it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into this coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the at the beginning male uh, made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for your blessings, uh, the blessings of the Word of God that we've heard today, and the teachings we've heard about our precious book and the text it was brought to us from. And Father, I pray that you'd bless this society, Lord, and help us to, to grow and spread the Word of God and the truth of our Bible. Father, we thank you, Lord, for those who gave their blood that we could have this book. And Father, I would ask you now to, to help us to stay true to it. And Father, would you be pleased today, this afternoon, to fill this preacher with your spirit, I pray. We take the blessed promised Holy Ghost to fill us to the uttermost. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now... Certainly, the Word of God is clear, but this passage is unmistakably deals with God's plan for, uh, for man to maintain purity within a society. And, however, we would have to agree that uh, the institution and the definition of marriage nowadays uh, is under great attack by the devil. And the failure to maintain a biblical, the biblical mandate for what constitutes marriage has put our nation on the course of destruction morally and has weakening the home and the church and, and our culture. 
And in this passage, we have a commanding principle set forth that not only applies to an individual marriage, and I want, I want it to be understood right now. I, I know none of you, and, and I don't know your past, and that's not what I'm getting at. You'll see in just a moment. That's not what I'm getting at. But we see here a commanding principle that's set forth to us uh, about not only the individual marriage, but also the institution of marriage. Uh, and... <clears throat> And by redefining marriage, we, we in fact destroy the concept of God joining one man and one woman, and, and then we promote man putting asunder what God has inseparably joined. And the lawmakers and special interest groups of our day are putting asunder what God hath joined together, and have launched a ship of debauchery, whose destination is the city of destruction and tearing apart the institution of marriage. Marriage, however, is not the only area that if it's tampered with and put asunder will bring eternal consequences. In creation, the Almighty has eternally uh, joined or joined many things that follow this same principle of let not man put asunder. These areas, if they're tampered with, will, and with that imbalance, bring death and destruction and trouble for a society and a culture. For example, we could look at uh, the idea of God's joined the members of our body. It wouldn't take us long to just think in our mind or remember someone who is a wounded warrior that has come home from the, from the, from the military with minus a limb or, or maimed in some way. And when that limb was severed, it changed that person forever. And it would never be the same. You can put on the artificial ones, but it would never be the same. And God, you know, it, how about the simple thing of water? If we separate the, and I'm not, not a chemist, and I, but I think if you separate water, you come up with two of the most volatile elements there is. But God has joined them together. And we have to have them that way. Now the principle, this principle holds true in a lot of areas, all areas of life. And I'd like to look at some areas uh, spiritually that God has joined together and, and if man puts asunder, will cultivate in havoc, wreaking havoc in our society in general and our churches in particular. And that's happening. It's easy to see the problems that are caused within Christianity and the church by the plethora of the new Bible versions that come about just about every month, it seems. And these versions of Scripture are succeeding in lining the pockets of the, of the publishers while they destroy the, faith of, uh, the, destroy the faith and the godly standards of both young people and, and the old people. You'd be surprised at some of the older Christians that are beginning to wonder about the Word of God and what's the Word of God. And in each version, we witness a manifestation of hatred for for God and the book that he's so joined together. And in these versions, these new versions, while they advertise that they're to bring us closer to God, they're systematically dismantling and destroying the doctrines of a verbally inspired word of God and, it, and threatening the eternal destiny of the souls of men. It's, an important, it's important to understand that where Satan is, where he's working to put asunder that which God has put together, and how he uses the critical text and the perverters of Scripture to destroy the Word of God and to corrupt a culture and to fracture the church that God purchased with His own blood, according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. So I, began to, I want us to look at some areas that God has inseparably joined together that must never be put asunder. And as a, as a pastor, you know that we're always faced with with the, uh, with the challenge of staying true to what we preach. And, and you preachers and missionaries and evangelists, you know that you're faced every day with, the, with, the, uh, with the, the threat that if you don't give in, then nobody will listen to you. I've got a Labrador retriever at home. He'll listen to anything I say. First of all, I want you to notice the first area that... Uh, the first area that God has inseparably joined together, that if it's tampered with, 
will, will bring great problems. First of all, that is, God has inseparably joined the Scripture to its authority. We have much questions today about the, about the authority of Scripture. You can't use the Word of God on me. I don't believe all It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. God said it. God expects us to live by it, and it has authority. It does. The proponents of the... Uh, the, the proponents of our King James Bible, these, uh, uh, with their critical text, began putting asunder the Scripture from its authority and by challenging the Scriptures, the Scriptures' verbal and plenary uh, inspiration and its uh, providential uh, preservation, the Word of God uh, as it declares for itself. They put that away. And I, for, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. And it says for four things. And I think I may have said this before, but it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He gave us four things there. First of all, he said for doctrine. And that is for our first steps. I'm so glad that when I first got saved, somebody sent me the right direction and set me, uh, gave me the right doctrine in my first steps as I began to walk as a Christian. Secondly, it says for reproof. That's for my false steps. When I, when I, I take a false step, the Word of God will get me back in line. And then for correction, that's my faltering steps. When I falter. But then he says, for instruction in righteousness, that's my forward steps, that I can walk for the Lord and with the Lord on a daily basis. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, 20, uh, verse 19 to 21 says, and you know it well, it says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do, you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in dark, a dark place until the, day dawn, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, Knowing first that, that no scripture of prophets that no that, that no prophecy of scripture is given uh, is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not of old, not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad that the Holy Ghost still moves. Amen. Now in. Matthew chapter 7, we remember about Jesus, and it says that they, that in verse 28 and 29 of chapter 7, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. <laughs> it looks to me like that the scribes are the ones that question the word of God and take the authority away from the word of God. What God hath joined together, or what God therefore hath joined together, let not man put asunder. He's joined inseparably the Scripture to its authority. Secondly, I want you to notice, if you turn with me to the book of Hebrews, very quickly, uh, and I'm trying to hurry, but Hebrews chapter 1, verse, verse uh, 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> notice, I'll, I'll read it, it says, And again, when he bringeth, uh, when he bringeth in the firstborn unto the, unto the, into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the, of the angels, he saith, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, of the, to the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. I would say to you today, men and women, that God has inseparably joined the Savior to his deity. He is Christ, our wonderful Lord. And having separate, we could go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17 as well. But having separated the, script, the Scripture from its authority first, then the textual critics will naturally continue on to tearing apart the doctrine of the deity of Christ by denial of His attributes and the character that's afforded only to the sovereign Lord that we have. And this separating of Christ from His deity and other vital doctrines of the Word of God is achieved by these textual critics by something that's called, it's been mentioned earlier, this dynamic equivalence. 
And I think for a hillbilly like me from Tennessee, dynamic equivalence just simply means that they are adding to or they are taking away from the Word of God but through their words or phrases and sometimes even complete passages. And they alter and deny the deity of Christ and they weaken the deity of Christ as given in our King James Bible and in, and, and in the, the received text. And these, these actions by these Bible correctors are nothing more than a blatant disregard and disobedience to the plain commands and warnings of the Scripture, not to add anything to or to take anything away. You can read Deuteronomy chapter 4. He says, ye, uh, verse 2, and he said, Ye shall not add unto the word which I have commanded you, and neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And then in Deuteronomy 12 and 32, and then in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 18, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto this, these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. The wise man said in, in the Proverbs, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We've found, we've found many liars today as, they, as the men that talked. They, they talked and showed us how that the people of these translators and these uh, committees have just simply lied about what they said they were doing. The devil always wants to separate the Savior from his deity and they're, they're therefore removing him as the object of our worship. What God therefore hath joined together let not man put asunder. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, thirdly, I'd like to say to you that uh, as we turn to, uh, if, if we would turn to 1 Peter, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse, verse uh, 18, For as much as you know that we were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by, tra by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who was fairly ordained from before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God that raised, him up, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. I would say to you that God has inseparably, God has inseparably joined salvation to the blood of Christ. There's no salvation apart from the blood of Christ. By either omitting the verses to the blood of Christ or changing the references to read death and the death of Christ uh, instead, of, instead of the blood, these critical text proponents will, are demeaning the blood of Christ and they're putting asunder what God is inseparably joined together. The Word of God calls the blood of Christ precious. It's precious to us. In his powerful blood as well. He cleanses the sinner from sin. Leviticus 17, 11, we all know that says, For it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. And speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God says in our King James Bible, it states in Colossians 1, 13, and the verses following, it says, Who hath, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. You see, the, the, the critics take salvation, the salvation from the blood, they separate it. Omitting or changing the blood of Christ removes the very source of our redemption and exposes these modernists and these liberals who hate the doctrine of salvation through the blood and gives credence to those who, who for years have despised and attacked the precious saving blood through which Christ purchased His church. If you look in Acts chapter, chapter 20 and verse 17 and the verses following, and those verses, you'll find there, there are three, three bloods that are mentioned there. If you talk, Paul talks about the, 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 the persecutions that he and the stripes and the beatings that he would have. That way we would see His blood. And then he talks about, he says, I was pure from the blood of all men. And then he talks about the blood through which Christ purchased the church. Amen? Amen. So we see that man has, whatever, what's, wherefore, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. 
We're in a day when everybody wants to tear away the Word of God. They want to weaken the, trans, uh, weaken the foundation on which we, we stand. They want to weaken the foundation of what we believe. And if they can destroy our Bible, if they can, if they can corrupt our Bible, then, then they've, got, they've won the battle. We have enough people that, that believe the book who walk around many times defeated and discouraged and despondent. And then when they read the other versions of the Scripture, the perverted versions, then they get more discouraged. More discouraged. Turn with me, if you would, over to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter, chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, and I'll not read, uh, I'll not read the, uh, all the chapter, of course. And I realize I'm doing something tonight, today that we tell the students in our Bible college that they shouldn't do. You shouldn't just read a verse of Scripture or a passage of Scripture and, and take it really out of its context. You shouldn't do that. But I'm telling you that the, the principle of putting asunder what God has joined together not only has to do with what he, as he mentioned there in Matthew, uh, uh, marriage, uh, the marriage bond and so forth, it has to do with a lot of other things. So... If you talk to one of our Bible college students, don't you ever tell him that I did this. But notice in, in Genesis chapter 9 and verse, verse 5 and 6. Notice he says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. I would say to you today, beloved, that God has inseparably joined sanctity <coughs> to life. As America's largest abortion group, the Planned Parenthood, in 2012 reported a record number of murders of unborn. And their report flaunts a year's total of 333, 964 abortions, pushing Planned Parenthood's three-year total to almost one million. In 2008, approximately 1.21 million babies were reported in the United States, uh, were, were, were reported as murdered in the United States, or aborted down from 1.29 million in 2002 and then 1.31 1, 1 million in 2000 and 1.36 million in 1996. From 1973 to 2012, over 50 million unborn babies were aborted legally in the United States. In our own city here of Marietta, Georgia, we're all waiting to hear the outcome of a trial of a father who, who locked his 22-month-old son strapped in his car seat in the family car at, in the parking lot of his work for seven hours in the hot Georgia sun while he went to work. The temperature on the outside was around 90 degrees. The medical examiner said the child died a horrible death. The father claims, I forgot the child. According to the testimony at his, uh, the hearing, evidentiary hearing, they discovered that while he was working, while this child is sitting strapped, a little 22-month-old boy strapped in his car seat inside a hot automobile, the father was in, in, in his place of employment sexting on his cell phone to three different women and the little child in the automobile roasting. I don't understand that. And he said, I forgot him. He, he took him from the house. They went to a restaurant, to the Chick-fil-A, and had breakfast that morning. Three minutes from the restaurant where they had breakfast, he parked the car, and he forgot him. We live in a day when they're taking sanctity, 
separating sanctity from life. God has inseparably joined sanctity to life, and life is precious. If you don't believe it, when we're on our deathbed, we'll give anything we have for one more moment. One more. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put us under. But then I want you to, I'd like for you to see in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. The scripture says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I remember back in 1970, we were privileged to adopt a little girl, Wendy, our daughter. She wrote somebody the other day on the Facebook. She said, I'm, she's 42 years old. She said, you know, I'm spoiled rotten. <laughs> she said, my dad has spoiled me rotten. And... But I remember standing in the courtroom in this county as the judge, after the 90 days of her in our home, he signed the paper. My wife and I stood before him with Wendy in her arms. And he looked at me and he said, Son, God has given you the responsibility of a living soul. The Jehovah's false witnesses and other deniers of immortality. Don't believe that God has inseparably joined the soul to its immortality. And folks, that's the, base, that's the basis of our message that every person that we know needs to hear the gospel. And they need to hear it not perverted. They need to hear it plain and pure as God wrote it, as God penned it down, God put it in the book. We must tell it to them. The Jehovah's false witnesses deny the existence of the human soul. And, of course, they use the perverted writings to make their case. And some of the, some of the different versions of Scripture follow suit in making, making the same subtle assertions as you, as you would read them. All of this is done while they say they're trying to bring the reader a greater clarity and a greater understanding of Scripture, but actually they're tearing asunder what God has joined together. I tell our folks, and some of our folks are here now, and they would say he says this a lot. People say, well, I want to, I want to, I want to, to uh, hear from God. I said, well, you hear from God, read your Bible, and you'll hear from God. They said, well, I want to hear God speak to me audibly. I said, well, read it out loud. <laughs> and God will speak to you. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Amen. And I would say to you that, uh, that uh, not only these things that I've mentioned, but the next thing, God has inseparably, inseparably joined sin to abomination. We've come to a time when relativism rules in every aspect of life. Relativism is defined by Merriam-Webster as a view that ethical truths depend upon the individuals or the groups holding them. Nothing could be more evident of this mentality than, than the view that's held by these, the sexual deviates in our day that are trying to impose cultural changes on a society that's contrary to the Word of God. Looking back in the book of, looking at the book of Leviticus in chapter 18, we see one of, the, one of the numerous places where God has set down His plan for moral purity, moral and sexual purity. And we see here in these, verses, in these chapters, especially 18 and 19, that God would never accept the moral standards of Egypt or the Canaanites. And Israel was given specific instructions not to follow. Folks, we cannot follow the morals of of the alley cats of this world. 21 times in the book of Leviticus 18 and 19, the phrase, I am the Lord, or I am your God appears, and the Hebrews were to obey and to follow God's laws. 
Ultimately, some of the critics, some of the critical text versions destroy or they rewrite the laws of God as set down regarding sin and immorality or, or sin and moral purity. And they erase the fact that sin is still an abomination to the Almighty. And tearing asunder, the tearing asunder of sin from its, from its, uh, from its abomination is seen in, some of the, in the self-confessed lesbians and pro-gay members of some of the translating committees, committees that are allowed to propagate and promote homosexuality as, a normal, as normal and acceptable. God help us. This putting asunder of what God had joined together is evidenced in Old Testament passages where words such as sodomite or sodomites are replaced by, by shrine prostitutes or male shrine prostitutes. And like in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 17 and 1 Kings 14 and 15 and 22 and then 2 Kings 23. In the message... The word is replaced with sacred prostitutes or cult prostitutes in the RSV or temple prostitutes in the New Century Version. This manipulation of God's word gives justification to a deviant lifestyle and, a, and attempts to produce a version of scripture that's acceptable to the sodomite community. What God has joined together let not man put asunder. Amen. It's the purity of our verbally inspired text that's been providentially preserved that has articulated God's standard in maintaining the moral purity of the church in particular and the society in general. You know, society, society is purer if they follow God's laws. Once this moral guideline is marred, it's, not only does it does a culture become more and more depraved and corrupt, but God and the people of God lose their thirst for God. And I'm afraid that's what these new versions are doing. They're causing us to get to the place that people within churches are losing their thirst for the presence of God in their life and the power of God in their life. God help us. This is what happens when, when man puts asunder what God has inseparably joined. If you would allow me to read a quote that Charles Spurgeon said. And he declared that while human authors were the instruments who recorded the scriptures, they were not, they were not the true author. And he said this, this is, and I quote, This version, uh, excuse me, this volume is the writing of the living God. Each letter was penned with an almighty finger. Each word in it dropped from the, neverla the everlasting lips. Each sentence was dictated by the Holy Spirit. Albeit that Moses was employed to write his histories with fiery pen, God guided that pen. In many, uh, it, it may be that David touched his harp and let sweet psalms of melody drop from his fingers. But God moved His hands over the, living string, over the living strings of His golden harp. It may be that Solomon sang canticles of love or gave forth words of consummate wisdom. But God directed His lips and made the preacher eloquent. If I follow the thundering of, the thundering of Nahum, Nahum when his horses plowed the waters... Or Habakkuk, when he sees the tents of Cushan in, in affliction. If I read Malachi, when the earth is burning like an oven. If I turn to the smooth page of John, who tells of love. Of the rugged, fiery chapters, or the rugged, fiery chapters of Peter, who speaks of fire devour, devouring God's enemies. If I turn to Jude, who launches forth anathemas upon the foes of God. Everywhere I find God speaking, it is God's voice, not man's. May God add His blessings to the Word of God. Would you stand with me and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank You for Your blessings. We thank You for the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance. We thank You for our precious book, 
And Lord, we thank you for this group, these men, Dr. Wade and these others who, who have stood faithful through these years. I pray, Lord, that you would keep us all faithful to the book. Keep us all faithful to the foundation on which we stand. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the saving grace of a sovereign God in our life. And we praise you and thank you for all that you've done and what you're going to do. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Now they took eight vials of blood from him. The little fellow passed out while they were doing it. And uh, after they got him stabilized there on the way back home, uh, he wanted to go by the, the place that had dirt bikes on sale. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we found out late last night that the blood that the blood tests and the MRIs were all clear. Right. So, and so apparently what this was was the, the lymph nodes trying to cleanse the system from the infection that was there. Yeah, apparently it had it maybe a week or so. But I, I do thank you for praying for him. Uh, uh, it really it really scared us. Uh, it did. And uh, so uh, uh, my, my wife really, my wife wasn't able to come last night. She was on the way here. Uh, and almost here she called me. She said, Dave, I can't. And so when she got home, uh, a little bit later, we, we thank God we found found it, uh, found out what it was. And I believe that our God answered prayer. Yes. Amen. 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 I believe that. I said, I'm not giving it over to medicine. I'm giving it to God. God did it. Amen. Amen. Did it. Amen. I believe it. Amen. And I, I don't know, but I asked, I signaled to Brother Richard if he would sing a song, uh, uh, maybe to keep me out of the doghouse. Uh, and uh, really what it, what it is, um, Miss Shirley doesn't know this, but while she was teaching this morning, uh, or in the late doing filling in for my wife Judy, she was actually going out over the internet all over the world. And uh, Brother Richard said, that's not fair. He said, uh, I think I need to. <laughs> not really, he didn't say that. He's gonna, I want him to come and sing for us. And, uh, I want him to come and sing. And he'll be a blessing to you, I know. Amen. Well, that was a good sermon. I, I don't change my opinion about some other things. That <laughs> was a good sermon. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 